Hi, I'm Greg, supervisor of crude clay production at Amico. We are proud to supply clay for your studio or classroom. This episode is brought to you by Amico Brent. Find Amico clay glazes and equipment at your local Amico distributor. Today's episode is brought to you by the Rosenfeld Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. The collection exists as an online resource for research and inspiration, featuring photos of thousands of objects made by over 800 artists. The images are high quality and can be used with no permission required, making them a great resource for students and teachers. To find out more, visit rosenfieldcollection.com. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 474 of the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. Today on the show, we have part two in an interview with renowned ceramic artist and educator Linda Sakura. If you didn't listen to part one, you can scroll back in the feed and hear her talk about growing up in Canada, as well as her path to being a potter. In this portion of the interview, we talk about the philosophy of education at Alfred University where she has been a professor since 1997, as well as her experience being in a family of creatives. Before we get to that interview, I did want to thank the folks that donate to our podcast. We are listener-supported, and I couldn't make the show without the generous contributions of folks like Chandra Debuse and Catherine Satterley. If you're interested in becoming a part of the support network that helps make this show, you can do that by visiting patreon.com slash redclayrambler. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. The other area of this idea of creative friction or that opposites or boundaries, things rubbing against each other can create energy that's inspiring I really see that in the structure of Alfred in the way that the teachers interact. Mm. So I've, I've gotten to come to Alfred a couple of times and, and I was giving a talk there and someone asked a question of me and I answered. And then after my talk was done, you engaged them in a way that was really surprising because oh. w- w- <laughs> I don't even know if you remember this, but you almost got in an argument. In the oh, middle really? of the auditorium with another serious? professor. Yes. <laughs> it, it was fantastic it. <laughs> for me it. as the person. So oh, I, I'm like literally coming off the stage, feeling a little rattled by the whole experience. And you're in the front row arguing with another professor <laughs> about <laughs> the nature of craft knowledge, which was what I was largely talking about in my talk. And the argument you guys were having is like, why would you – preference one form of knowledge over another. Mm, mm -hmm, And I was so impressed. mm -hmm. One, that you took one of my ideas and argued with someone else about it. That was awesome (laughs) because it kind of made me feel cool. But more than that, just the idea that like at Alfred, teachers argue as a way of understanding. Like I didn't get the feeling you guys were mad at each other. You were really engaging with craft knowledge versus art knowledge and what that meant in that moment. Right. So yeah. can you talk about how Alfred works in this idea of creative tension? Yeah, you know, I I hadn't really um, thought about Alfred being built on tension, but, um, you know, as tension is energy, it's certainly built on energy, you know, and there's a lot of energy there. And, you know, and, and it's really paid attention, I think, within ceramics, um, you know, that's there's the whole school and then there's of course the areas and the areas have their own distinct ways of thinking about their structure. But, but, but we pay attention to this idea of art craft design, which is nomenclature, you know, and there's, and it's theoretical, 
is there are theoretical categories. And, you know, should I say I pay attention, we pay attention? If one of us is paying attention, the other one's going to end up being exposed to it, as you witnessed, in one way, shape, or form, because we are always in dialogue. So the dialogue, you know, that maybe was happening at the end of your talk wouldn't be unlike dialogue that might happen in a meeting about programming or um, you know, a critique in, um, you know, with, with a class or with a student, et cetera. And um, so, so it is definitely built on, on energy and points of view. And, and it's been a very conscious building of the program to, to really represent these realms theoretically in, in some way. Um, through our pedagogical approach, through the types of undergrad classes we offer, uh, through uh, our practices as, as makers. And at the same time, we know there are theoretical categories, right? And theory is not practice. And so there's lots of crossing over and, and mixing up. And so when you have that going on at, and on any given day, um, you know, someone might be thinking along one track and then someone flips the switch and then the train goes down the other uh, when you're in this constant collective dialogue. And it's really has been a gift to not always only be in dialogue with oneself. Um, that there's this constant going um, back and forth. And because each of these realms has a set of principles on which material practices and procedures are based and theories and scholarship and uh, contemplations and speculations, and we can teach down that line, let the students know that we're teaching down that line at the undergrad cl class uh, levels. But when it comes to the seniors and the grad students, they're just they just have one practice. They're just in the studio. And then they put it together. I think some of the thinking is not necessarily that our students go from, away from the program working, um, you know, working through our pedagogy or, or sort of um, that we give them the tools to sort of move into the world. I think you know, the thinking really is that they're going to remake what visual culture becomes. So, so that's where it's really important to just sort of, even when you have a point of view that's personal, to remember that's what it is. And to also keep in place these sort of realms that are not real but theoretical. And that those can be applied in many ways. And in fact, we're finding out all the ways in which we've applied our thinking through uh, theoretical realms that just doesn't work, you know, which is how you get scholarship like Donna Haraway's, right? Staying with the trouble where she's, you know, talking about string figures and spectacular fabulation. And how do you sort of connect up and sort of work out knowledge that comes from connection? I mean, that's everything that we're struggling with as a greater society today. And how do you take care of everything in it? How, how does that work? Um, so, you know, the students really are going to reinvent it all. And so it's uh, both, I think, responsible and also liberating to understand the difference between theory and practice and to be able to sort of demonstrate for the students just the energy around it. And I guess you were right in the middle of a prime moment. I wish I could <laughs> remember that one. Maybe there's been too many of them. I don't know. <laughs> But um, so I think that's a that's um, that is a good observation, and it's and it's a really important one uh, because I think it's so important to realize your place in the larger picture when you're a faculty. You know that you're in there as part of something much much bigger than you that will go on much much longer than you will. And I'm really interested in this as an interpersonal study because you have your life as a professor and your understanding of theory and you're engaging that with your peers and with the students, but then you also have the interpersonal relationships of people you're in staff meetings with when you're tired and you're bored and you're hungry and you're, you know, all these like emotional states that come from just living life and how you balance that so you can engage with everyone, but also not hold something against them <laughs> because yeah. they made you mad one day mm -hmm. when you were really just hungry. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like it's, it's funny to me how this all 
comes out in the wash when you're in a relationship with a group of people for a long amount of time. Yeah, it's very true. You get to know each other quite well. You always bring food to the meetings. So as divi- <laughs> <laughs> you really do. I'm serious. As division head, it was the most important thing is get to the grocery store <laughs> before the meeting. <laughs> so you're right about the hunger thing. But you also, yeah, but you do sort of, um, I, I guess, I guess there's, you sort of can, uh, you become agile with each other, right? You become flexible with each other too. And, and understand just, um, and, and and I think even uh, patient intellectually with them as well, you know, see where they're going. And yes, it's sort of, you know, what's being said is built into this persona and personality right now, but there's something, there's something there to, to pull forward. So, uh, you know, I think that's, um, I think that that's uh, just part of, part of commitment and professionalism. And, um, and it really does, you know, if there's a moment where someone sort of slips, <laughs> someone does get too hungry or too tired, then it's like, okay, we got to call it, let's just call it, you know, let's call it and rebook it, because you really need to be there as a professional. And so I think over time, we've just become quite sensitive to that. And we build in the al- algorithms. One thing that I uh, started as division head, which we've kept doing, is just every every week we meet once at a noon time, right? Everyone brings their lunch and we get together and we just do some ongoing business. And then some of the more intense business happens in different longer meetings. But you find out, you find strategies like that because you're trying to keep that part of the community healthy too. And it is, you're right, a real um, privilege both to be in those forums and a, a real responsibility to show up um, with your full self, as much of yourself as you can show up with, and and to see people, you know, you and and I guess if one is a teacher, one learns how one learns that perhaps the most important thing to do is to be able to see the person, right? You know, in terms of who, you know, what their, you know, what the pedagogy is or what the business of the class is or what the what the assignment of the week was, et cetera. It's like, yes, there's all that and that's there and that's tended to. And then there's the business of really seeing who it is before you because they're, 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 a person, you know, a unique person. And that's, I mean, that's the thrill and that's the potential. Yeah. I want to talk about how teaching relates to this. Cause I think me, you know, like the saying me, you meet the students where they're at is something that, he, that I hear people say a lot. And, and I think, it, I think it's true, but also I think you meet the student where you can see them going, you know, like your teaching ultimately leads them in a way that they can't see within themselves yet. <laughs> and I think the process of going to an undergraduate or a graduate program is empowering the students to see this within themselves slowly over a process. <laughs> so can you talk about learning as a younger teacher and then after now teaching for more than 20 years, how you've learned how to empower students to both question themselves, but also believe in themselves? Well, they do need the tools, right? So I'm very disciplined, especially at the sophomore level uh, and at the junior level, first semester. So the first half, so they do foundations, which is separate. They get into ceramics. They have three years in there. So those first three semesters, um, they need to stuff their pockets (laughs) and and move their bodies and feel like they can groove in any part of the facility and they're, you know, going to ask the question and they're going to approach the equipment and they're going to dig into that bin of material. So there's that. And that's huge. Um, That's that is agency. Right. And agency is doing you have to be doing. And that's a big part of it. So they need to be empowered. Um, and that's just like stuff. That's not, you know, walking into the class and like, oh, I read this really great bit of theory lately. And, you know, <laughs> I think you'll like it. You know? um, but that's going on. And then you model it. Right. You model it in your professionalism, your professionalism as a teacher, your agility with the materials, uh, your agility with the processes. 
um, your dedication to your career, you know, things like that. You model it that way. So they see that thing there. And so there's a bit of belief starts to form, a little nugget of maybe there's something here. Um, and um, and then there's the greater context, right, which is back to what we were speaking about in terms of what history is and what contemporary culture is. There's also little... Um, you know, disclaimers uh, too that you can offer, like don't don't confuse creative culture with the art market. Um, hmm, what's that mean? Well, let's <laughs> talk about that. You know, um, what we're what are we doing? You know, what are we doing here really in society? What is our role in society? What are we doing? So there's those really big questions, and then there's all the way into how do you develop agency with this material to make this objective that you have that might sort of, you know, be something you can hold in your hands? So um, there's all those parts. And I think you really have to pay attention to all of them. Um, the the um, generosity is important with them, and but also just in, integrity, generosity, all those things are just words, aren't they? <laughs> but you know, when you put them into the into act, action, you know they're happening. Like you know when you connect, and you know since COVID too, there's a whole. I think some of the students that got took a gap year or just uh, were in online during high school. Uh, there's a dynamic in those students, too, where some of them are just readjusting at really different rates and finding really different ways of, um, what should I say, finding, well, I think more aware of their own capacities in some ways and their own their own sort of, uh, uh, you know, places they need help and others. So, so they're a bit more self-aware in, in that sense and more willing to speak about it perhaps, um, uh, or at least pull it into the conversation and realize that what's going on in the studio is actually going to be impacted by all of those pieces around it. So that's, that's, you know, that's been both, you know, a lift and it's also been helpful in some way. I think fundamentally that energy of um, that energy will be guided into more consciousness is what I'm hoping, even if now it's a bit more heavy to carry uh, per se. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of all of those parts and then really trying to separate them from you, you know, what they're doing and learning from your agenda of what you want them to do and learn or, or how that might look different. And it's not personal. <laughs> right? It's professional. And so it might look different, but if you let yourself see what's actually there, it can be amazing. And it's, um, I had this great experience recently with a, with someone who was in a sophomore class and the, the students had to take a 3D class and this was their 3D class and it was not their forte at all in any way. But that person could take a very small, barely molded piece of clay, let it dry a little bit, flip it over, use two turns of the wheel to cut that foot, better than most feet I've seen <laughs> in all my years, flip that back over and paint that surface like nobody's business. They were a painter, you know, so they could turn that wheel slow and draw with that tool. And then right beside them, there's someone that came in with all this high school pottery and they're like, <laughs> you know, and it's like, slow down. So, so, I mean, that person who, and I completely readjusted the curriculum for them and their peers were just so amazing. They all met this person and supported them too. And um, they had a really good experience, but that's not going to happen if it's like, you got to do these, you know, this is the, this is the, this is the drill. So it's sort of this combination of like having you know, really putting all those pieces in place, but do remember, you know, just really seeing the students too. And so, and I, you know, I cut a deal with this student. I said, look, you know, this is at midterm. Look, I, I guarantee you will pass this class 
if we, you know, come up with this alternative plan and you follow through on it. And I said, and so we came up with a plan. I said, give me a number. And they gave me a number. And then I like doubled it and gave it back. <laughs> and we went forward. <laughs> so, um, so there's that. And, um, you know, and so it's very, um, a, a very live thing. And I guess that's, you know, if it's not a live thing like that, then I don't know what the point would be in fact, and and um, I don't know that many people endure uh, teaching uh, if it's not live in their in their being and in their imagination and in their the way they uh, the way they go forward. I mean, I just I mean, sometimes Matthew just laughs at me because it's like, you know, I'm teaching sophomore wheel. I don't know how many times I was <laughs> he's like, can't you do the same thing twice? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no, I can't because the students keep changing. You know, it's a different year. It's completely different. <laughs> I, I can't. I have to start all over again. Well, I think it shows your love and dedication to the process of teaching, that you just really believe in this process. So you'll change the process, but you're going to engage with them and believe in them, which I actually think means more to those students than if you teach them how to trim. Or teach them how to whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that I think that's really true. Yeah. I, I think that's right. Yeah. I do really, I truly true. I still, you know, I, it's just so funny, you know. I mean, still, I was just sort of la shaking my head, laughing at myself. I must have just gone to talk to the Tia Craft people about retirement or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> and I'm walking out of a class and um and sort of, you know, just like shaking my head as I walk out this these back stairway. It's like I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky. Like I still walk out of that building thinking that. And it's and then I see myself. Then I notice myself walking out of the building thinking that. <laughs> so that's really uh that's kind of a nice part of it. Yeah. That's really great. Along the lines of teaching undergrads, teaching skill is important. Like they have to have a foundation. Like I think you described it as they're gathering tools and stuffing their pockets, which I love that analogy. You know, that like they're, they're, it's a time in which they try, every, it's like going to the food court in a mall and eating all the food. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like they need a lot. But then at some point, they have to pick a skill and, or a set of skills and then push forward with those. And I think that often the student's work gets better faster because they're focused. But then at some point, if they don't diversify again, their work starts to stagnate because they're so obsessed with making the skill better. And I see this particularly with undergraduate students that have been in high schools, like you said, like a high school, learning clay in high school is great, but it often sets like a predetermined way of thinking that could be a limitation down the road. So I want to just think broadly about the, the role of skill building and when it's important to push that, and then when it's important to de-emphasize that to get them to start thinking more about the context. So when is skill building good and when is it a trap? Yeah, good question. Um, both building skill and not being building skill can be a trap, you know, and that's the problem with the visual arts. <laughs> There's traps everywhere, <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> And it's just, it really is case by case, as you said. I think what I think in some ways there's 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 sort of the teacher, right? So there's what you do in a class, in a semester, and then there's the program. And it's I think really important to uh, and and we're always you know thinking about that, right? How the program operates to put out the most prepared student. Uh, and also then how we as individuals operate within the program. Um, and in that way, we've kept some fairly strident boundaries so that, um, you know, the sophomores have to take one or two classes and those classes have a focus and et cetera. So speaking to what you're talking about in terms of uh, being um, fluid uh, being able to move fluidly in the facility, use all the equipment, uh, deal with materials, et cetera. Um, so that's important to think about the program. Uh, the and in the program at the senior year, uh, they're out of the, they're no longer in a class structure. 
they're working in a studio, they're running their own studio, they have two advisors, and they're sort of, it's like a pre-grad program. Um, certainly, another piece that I need to mention is our graduate students. It's a really great program for students who want to teach because our graduate students are assisting every single class. And I work really closely with my graduate students and typically offer them to run a project uh, so that they can gain that teaching experience too. And so, and they're in community. So, so there's the program and then there's the, there's, there is the proximity. So the grad students and the seniors who are more independent and the sophomores and the juniors are all in one space. They're, they're talking to each other about co-firing and kiln spaces. Seniors and grads have access to the kilns. Sophomores and ju juniors are working with two EAs who are also firing their own kilns and sometimes putting classwork in their kiln. And then we're getting together to do sort of like bigger atmospheric firings, et cetera. So this idea of how the program has become a large community is essential in terms of the teaching. And it's um, if I took what I was doing and someone put me on a campus in some building over there, aside from grad students, aside from other classes or even with the undergrads, but not near the grad students in the facility, I wouldn't be able to do the same thing. Something different would have to happen. Um, so, so that proximity is maybe the greatest teacher because someone who's very, because they'll be you know, you go, so I've gone in there at night at times, like, you know, to do some stuff that like maybe I had to go pick up some docs or something at 11 at night. And I like walk through the back halls. I keep my head down, not because they're going to come and ask me questions, but because I'm an intruder at that <laughs> point, there's something else going on there. Um, so I think that, um, I think that because there's so much going on all the time, they, they know that what they're doing is part of a quote unquote practice when it's a skill that's being built. And they also know that when they're accomplishing maybe the perfect form, that, that that's not necessarily the ticket either, because it's not necessarily getting a platform that maybe it might have gotten in high school. So the context is very significant in that way. It does a lot of the work. Um, on an individual level, I think that it's a different kind of a conversation because I think sometimes there's a lot of capital. I mean, some people just really are uh, tune into uh, or deepen themselves through their physicality. You know, maybe they're very athletic, maybe they're very uh, coordinated. And so they love precision, they love control. And so how do you actually, how do you take that and actually, maybe it's not that they have, maybe it's not precise enough. Maybe it's not controlled enough. So where do, where do you push that so that it, it touches a node of energy and connects to something else, right? How do you go deep enough or far enough into it that it connects up into something? Or how do you sort of sidestep it? It could be either way. And maybe at a uh, undergrad level, you can create a project where both happens. Let's do this at the same time, right? Let's go so far in there that you're down in the metal shop grinding those tools <laughs> and making them, and you're going to start forging them in the foundry. And then let's go this other place where you don't get to use anything but your fingertips. And when I come back next week, we're going to look at both of these, right? So just maybe making, just taking something, that whole thing about just opening it up. How do you enlarge something enough so that you can just make a bit more space for yourself? Because typically they want out too, right there they want to leave this and and there's always a point like you know you can have a sophomore come in and they've just been doing so much throwing it's crazy and they're the star of the class and they're teaching all the students and hours it's really great and and they just have to go through the repertoire so you go as fast as you can <laughs> <laughs> and get through all the repertoire, you know, for them, They're, they go as fast as they can get through their repertoire, you know, and you go with them, right? And you find a lot of things uh, along the way. And of course, you also pop up the end of uh, that line of things, and you're in a new space, and you're sort of like, oh, okay, here we are. 
uh, <laughs> the other side of something. So it really does depend on the individual. And some of the, you know, some of the recently I had someone come in that had a lot of chops, you know, a lot of chops and really uh, wanted to do something very specific all the way to, through and um, and had a certain type of a background education that I completely related to because it felt like it was right out of the 80s. And I just let him have it all. And it was great. And his, their peers loved it and they loved it. And they developed a critical eye for their work like they didn't have before. And they were charged. And so, you know, if I would have said, no, you can't make that form, you know, like that thing, like, well, then it's just going to be sitting there waiting and taking up space waiting. It's like, you know, just plow it through. Just go all the way in. Let's go all the way there. See where we get. I'll come with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wanted to end um, talking about family. Are you okay uh, talking about family? Yeah. Um, I I looked at the, the questions that you sent. I didn't have a lot to write about it, but you always seem to have a way to travel. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> well, w- one of the things I wanted to start with is is the relationship you have with Matt. Matt met your husband, started as makers. Like you guys met, I think you met at the Bray, right? Yes, yes. He, w- he was a full-time resident and I was a summer resident. And I've talked to him about that. And another- I'm doing another podcast series about the Bray. And we were talking about it would be fun to do a series of people that have fallen in love at the Bray because it's oh. actually a surprising amount of people, like tons, <laughs> dozens. <Yeah. laughs> dozens. What I wanted to talk about, though, is like when your relationship starts as a creative interchange, because that's how we, we when you work together in a space, it's really a creative it's dancing, you know, like mm. it's an interplay, mm-hmm. interplay of ideas. And that sets up a interpersonal romantic relationship in a very different way mm. than if you meet at a bar somewhere. <laughs> so I wondered if you just had any reflections about being in a creative partnership over, you know, decades now and what that gives you as a person and a maker. Yeah, I think that's right. I think uh, with Matthew, uh, he was such a intense uh, studio person. He just was in there all the time. And he was also had this exceptional training um, that is just rare these days, uh, rarer these days. This apprenticeship was someone that came from, uh, he probably, well, you have to listen to his podcast probably to get the details on that. But he worked with a potter that had a an amazing sense of of his practice. His relationship to form was very powerful. Um, And the way he threw the structure of his pots was very powerful. And Matthew has that in his work. He's an incredibly powerful thrower and in uh, certain kinds of form languages just um, calibrated so specifically and um, a lot of wisdom in that in that work. So and and I remembered that from the work more. Um, and in fact, that really caught my attention even more so at the time than the surfaces. But then, of course, the surfaces were really connected to, you know, for him, he talks a lot about quilts, et cetera, and his mother quilts and quilted her whole life. And she's just her 99. Oh, wow. And we went to see her. And um, she lives with his brother, et cetera. But he's always had this great affinity for pots, grew up in Indiana. The whole family collected a, just wonderful quality antiques. Those auctions were really quite something, a lot of the early um, American crockery uh, and quilts. And um, so that's where a lot of the surface deco came from. But that, that, power that he has as a thrower and uh, his discipline as a maker is really uh, unique. I find it really unique. And and so in some ways, um, you know, that caught my attention. I mean, you know, I think that, and, and so that was very, you know, that was quite other than my experience. I came up through, I didn't have an apprenticeship. Well, I did have an apprenticeship, but it was sort of an apprenticeship. I just apprenticed with a the teacher who was my teacher in um, Nelson, British Columbia. But it was very, it wasn't disciplined and rigorous in the same way. I did try to get one of those jobs 
uh, where, you know, you sit down and you throw a line of work and the person comes by and knocks them into the bucket, as Matt talks about. And I went in and I threw one day and they said, maybe you should go back and work with your teacher. <laughs> this is when I was just starting out. So I didn't have that the privilege of that kind of a background or that kind of an education. So I think that's always that sort of, I think, has um, always fascinated me. So and, and I think now. Um, you know, obviously there were, there's all of the ways you are connected because you're working in a field together too, you know, and, and that carries something as well. And now, you know, in terms of our relationship now, I mean, in some ways he gives me some street cred with the students, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I really do like bringing them up to see him work because of the way he touches and handles material in this incredibly sort of intelligent but matter of fact way and so it's it's just so direct and it's there's just so much material has gone through his hands over time so that's um you know that's been you know that's been very important to me you know we have the way our practices have unfolded have stayed pretty distinct um, because of my choices to teach and his choices to be in this studio full time. Um, I did commission him to make me some plates, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and I do think, you know, I'm sort of like, uh, maybe we should try to get together and do this together. And he's always a little dubious about it. Like, <laughs> you know, whether it's like, you know, maybe we should, let's, let's have a, let's have a home sale together. And, you know, so, you know, he's always, I got to go to the studio, you know, <laughs> he's sort of a person of few words when it comes to that uh, type of thing. So, um, I mean, that's, that's one thing I can say about that. I think that background and that training is the thing that was really the, uh, the, the piece that we had. And then, you know, then he, then I am a teacher and connected to the students in a way that he has absolutely no interest in, in the sense of not that he doesn't believe in education and really support it, but just that that's not how he's going to spend his time. You know, he's going to, he's very much a solo studio artist. Well, you guys have like a very classic artist setup where your house is beautiful, but it's it's a modest house compared to the size of the studio. The studio <laughs> is gigantic, <laughs> which I love it when artists do this. It cracks me up every time. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit absurd. Um, well, it's interesting. Yes, this I mean, this is this house was a back to the land house that was built in the 80s. And so and, and the people that built it, good, my good friend still. Um, laid with her partner every one of these stones, but uh, they had been living in Japan. And so it's about this multi-purpose space. So yes, it's 800 square feet. It's very efficient. It's small. Um, and the studio is like a slab on grade, um, <laughs> you know, drive up to Penyan and get the cheapest siding you can uh, and kiln building, but it is big. It is big. And part of the problem with that was this. We had the idea that we were going to put an addition on this house and we thought this is too complicated. It's a, you know, we need to bring in an architect and Wayne Branham, who shares a studio with Mark Ferris, amazing potter himself. We had him come out and look and draw up some exceptional drawings for us for how you would actually add on to this house. And at the same time, he sketched out the studio. And we were feeling, I don't know, a bit idealistic or overly financially ambitious. Um, so we never did do the addition, but we did build the studio he sketched out. And one thing he did was he drew the pitch of the roof at the same pitch as this roof that's in the house, which is a fairly steep, tall pitch. And then they brought in the trusses. <laughs> and I took a look and I thought, oh, my I'm not sure we need that much above our heads. I mean, what it did do is we divided the studio in three. And so we have a loft where we can store the bulky soft materials. So that ended up being productive. But that makes the studio look especially large. Um, but the other thing that we had to do is we decided we had to absolutely have separate spaces. So um, we each have a private space, separate space with a door, and there's a center space. Across from that center space uh, is the kiln building. So whoever's in a firing cycle uses the center space to stage the loading and unloading, and whoever's not retreats to their studio. 
you know, keeps everything in their studio. So we ended up doing it that way because we did really feel like we we have very different habits in the studio, very different things we listen to, how we operate, the way we keep or don't keep our spaces. <laughs> and so all of that needed to have parameters if the marriage was going to survive. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's where we paid a lot of attention and just thought, nah, we can live in a small house together. And, you know, the truth is we do spend most of our time outside of it. So it it was a good choice, a very good choice. <laughs> well, I wanted to bring your daughter into this discussion. She's a, really a phenomenal musician. And when you're sort of the mother or, or you're caring for someone who is doing a very skill-based musical practice, classical violin, how do you know when to push them? And to push her and say, like, yes, you do need to actually practice. This is, you've committed to this, you need to do it. Or when do you need to be the parent that is just the loving hand that says, actually, let's watch a movie because Uh, you've practiced five hours today? (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. You know, like, how do you balance that? When to push and when to sort of nurture that's not pushing? Yes, I think that's that's, um, a very sensitive part of the relationship and and in the beginning of course you know when we when she was little you know she was doing t-ball and swimming and soccer and you know music she plays violin that's the only instrument there was around here to learn and you know so she was doing all those things we didn't know which way she'd go and you just follow them around and drive them all these places and then she got very hooked into the violin there was a period where um, you know, she would just sort of show up and do the playing and she'd play a little bit on her own. And then she started getting more and more invested. And then the teacher started getting, you know, she's getting older and, she, and, she, and then she starts having to, you know, discipline herself to practice. I don't remember so much in those early years asking her to practice. She always, you know, had her teacher's book and would go through it and um, picked up the instrument enough that she was interested in it. You know, she was interested in picking it up, so she did. Um, But then there's a point at which she started to take it more seriously and we started commuting to get her lessons. And then we, you know, when you're starting to put out more of your own energy and time, then you're starting to think you're more aware of their energy and time as well. And so, um, you know, the practice keeps on, uh, you know, the time she's spending playing and the pieces and the music she's learning keeps accelerating and she goes with it. Like we just sort of saw, then the relationship changes, right? So it's like, well, you know, are you ready for your lesson? You know, we're going, the lessons now, are you ready for your lesson? So that starts to happen. So there was an intermediate time there where she was, getting, uh, needing to prepare for sort of rehearsals and, and picking up more, um, you know, picking up more lessons. She had two teachers for a while and we were more involved in that and being, and she was, you know, here and in the house and the house is small. And, and so, you know, being on top of the music and more integrated with it. And, um, but now she's gone, gone to school. She got into, um, she auditioned and got scholarships to go to a school for the arts that has music. So now we're completely out of it. And in fact, and, and it's, it's much more intense too, you know, so she, you know, I think the last year she was at home, that um, balance of like, it was more like just, just being aware that this was up to her, but also, (laughs) you know, some disciplining yourself to just give her charge. But then it's like, did you practice today? Oops. (laughs) You know, (laughs) it's sort of like you can't help a little bit being concerned that they're prepared, right? They have, you know, something's coming up. Are you prepared? So, but now that she's gone, it's like, we're completely out of it. So she, at 13, she left to start this school last year and she, she's outside of Boston in a place called Natick. And then she goes into the New England Conservatory every Saturday and that's where she has her private lesson. And, um, and so she's at a level that's very intense right now. And she is around peers 
who, you know, there's a whole bank of practice rooms at the school she's at. So now she's really driven by what she needs to do in her peers. I mean, it's a little disconcerting when she comes home sometimes still, because when she comes home, she'll crash and she doesn't really get to crash any other time. So we just have to realize, okay, there's less practicing now because she's cracked crashing and, and, you know, just it's in her court. So right now she's at a summer, a senior camp where she's every week, she's learning a quartet. So they start, they get put in their group at the beginning of the week and then they perform it at the end of the week. So it's all built in. So most of the time she's got a very, she's got commitments and obligations either now to her teacher or to her peers and um, so it, it's all like that. We, but so now we worry about her well-being in other ways, right? So that's what that is, you know, about practicing. You know, it's just worrying about their well-being. Will they feel prepared? Will they be confident? She came out and played a. Um, she won a competition to play a solo in front of the Finger Lakes Orchestra, of which she was part of their youth orchestra. But she, the competition was to play in front of the adult orchestra. And I left her in the dressing room, and uh, as the as the program was starting, and I said, "How do you feel?" I said, um, "I said, are you a little bit nervous?" She goes, "I'm excited," <laughs> and I thought, "Wow, that's so great." Uh, and she had a great time doing it, but it's intense now. And sometimes now the work is to realize that she feels pressure. She's going from a small pond to a big pond. And she did not, you know, there's, there's, you know, a lot going on. And so now it's just trying to figure out how to help her you know, not even necessarily help her, but just how to be there when she's feeling stressed or when she's feeling pressure. And also because she's now 14, she's a teenager. And even knowing how to, um, one, being able to articulate what you're feeling or wanting to is one thing. And then the other thing is it's like the weather, <laughs> right? It changes with the weather. So it's a whole, so a lot of it, I think almost all the way through, really, I guess what the first part taught us was to just, you know, pay attention and wait. And now, now it's really, it's completely hers. We really, it really is completely hers. And now the job is just to support her and know that there's any number of paths she could take. Um, and we have no idea what that will be. You know, she's very young still, and she she's planning to finish, obviously, go. And she talks about music as being her focus and and her path. And it is this year, and it may be next year, and it may be for her life. But we've just really dialed back all of our fantasies and expectations. And when they're the cutest little things wandering around in their performance clothes with their, you know, three quarter size violin, you just are having so much fun. <laughs> and, <laughs> and now it's like a teenager, you know, with a full size violin and needing a new bow and needing to upgrade and trade it in and, you know, two sets of strings a week. And, and it's like, breathe and be there and um, just uh, keep your eye on the weather. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, it's amazing to me to think about you and Matt, both being very passionate makers that have long-term makers. Like you guys have <laughs> yeah. devoted your lives to this. And then you're raising a daughter who is devoted in her own way to to this musical practice is so different than my parents. Both both of my parents have no overwhelming, they have no singular passion in their lives. So I've never seen them. Actually, my dad is with horses. That's the thing that is uh. his thing. I just think it's a phenomenal gift to give to your child to show them your own passion. And she's been absorbing that her whole life. Yes, that's probably true. She has been absorbing that. And, um, and, and I think it really different versions of it. You know, I heard her, I think I heard her say something about teaching once. In fact, you know, it sort of slipped out. I mean, because she watches her teachers, you know, and she really admires them and enjoys them. And so um, she said something about that once. But um, yes, it has been. And I think for, for to go back to the beginning of the question, you know, in terms of you know, what we did and what she 
is going to do, like it could be, and I see how it's really easy to conflate that. You know, I feel like, I don't know, I put one step in front of the other and just sort of followed the energy. And that's how this all unfolded in terms of how my life played out with this, my relationship to this profession. And, you know, um, but when she's looking at it, it looks like a thing that I just like you, well, you picked a path and you just went down that, right? It could look that way when it really isn't this unfolding. And just to remember that it will unfold for her and it may not look the same way, you know, that she might um, use all those uh, skills that she's developing in another way. So it is, you know, I'm happy. I'm really happy she's in music because it's, um, it's such a, um, it's, it's just something that you can really carry and, and the instrument she has, she's not, <laughs> she's not, she doesn't have a stand up bass or a piano <laughs> to lug around, you know, I mean, a stand up bass is okay. At least you can get a plane seat for it. But, um, but she has, I think the most important thing that she has right now, which is especially important for her because of her story is she has community. And she is a child that needed community. And when she started school out here, it was very difficult for her to find community out in this rural New York space. Um, we found community in the university, or it might have been difficult for us. I'm completely an urban child. And um, it was difficult for her because of her story. And she has found community and she is with her people right now as she goes through these troubled years of uh, teenagedom. Um, and I am especially uh, grateful for that. Well, I think this is a good place to wrap up. Can you plug the website for the, the Darkening Ground, the show? So that's uh, Fair and Contemporary dot com and um and she should have everything that's up there she's putting up another uh, show right now which is a piece of a lot of uh, artists that she represents but um it's fair and contemporary.com and you're on instagram too as well right you know i am that's another whole conversation i have a <laughs> Instagram gives me existential crises almost every time I go up on it. So, you know, Matthew posts on my Instagram account, like he'll post things for me, especially when it's like family oriented, he'll post. And I am not so good at it because I don't, I'm on the screen a lot doing other work right now. I'm trying to put together this writing for Leslie and, um, and this has been great. The, just this, the questions that you, um, have brought up and the focus that you bring has been helpful because that will help me in this larger project. And, but, um, so I'm on the computer a lot. And so I really tend not to go on it otherwise, although <laughs> I do, you know, I was literally talking to Matthew the other day about, you know, should we do something like, let's do a, let's, let's sell some work together on Instagram, like have a separate place or maybe we can make that work and let's do something together. So, I think that would be kind of fun to do. I like the idea of going from a show at Fair and Contemporary on Mass Mocha Way to like a sale of really great kitchen pots on Instagram. <laughs> I like that agility and and I'm interested in that. So maybe we can get together with that. So I think, you know, at this point, what's what's a little frustrating about it is that it changes so much and it's gotten a lot of bells and whistles. So when I go on now, it's like, I'm just like, what, you know, it, it, you know, I have to, I don't really have, you have to my, reteach yourself. I have to reteach. I don't really have any sea legs with that platform right now. Um, but anyways, that's one conversation we've had about it. So I'm sort of on there. And will be, maybe let's, you know, maybe, well, we'll use Matthew's, we'll use Matthew's uh, account, perhaps if we do that show together, but maybe, maybe to come. Uh, we used to always keep it, keep it very separate, uh, deliberately. And that was probably me really drawing the line in a hard way as, as women have needed to at various times in the history. And now I think that, uh, I think we could do something. So stay tuned. Well, thanks so much. I really appreciate this. Thanks, Ben. I'd like to thank Linda for doing this interview. This is the first two-parter we've done in 10 years. 
Before we go, I'd like to thank today's sponsors. That's Amico Brent, the Archie Bray Foundation, and the Rosenfield Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor on the show, you can get in touch through our website. That's BrickyardNetwork.org. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you all for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.